2002, right? That Screaming Infidelities? Yeah. That, so that that's like a total game. That's like a g- game changer. Yeah, unexpected. Like I had this uh, TV so awards, all that shit. Yeah, I had the the Swiss Army. Ro- sorry, Swiss Ar- the album Swiss Army Romance has Screaming Infidelities, and again I go and notice on there those both appear on places because the yeah. record label that bought it from Amy, when I said I was not going to sign there, that I didn't think the contract was very fair. Um, they said they were going to shelve my record. Damn. And, you know, I'm not going to speak ill of them because we've all kind of like, we all understand we were just all young. They were young. Oh, I was young. Yeah. We didn't really know what we were doing. And there's, there's no, there's no animosity these days, but in my worry, I was like, well, I'll make a new record. That's it. That's all I'll do. But I didn't have enough songs. So I was like, well, I'll just, maybe if I did a band version of those two songs, I could fill out this record and that's what I did. So Damn. that's the only reason screaming even has that version that exists was that somebody was going to shelve the record, did shelve the record. Yeah. And, and so I, I re-recorded screaming as a band and that was, I guess what it needed. And yeah, MTV kind of came calling, like we weren't going to make a video or anything, but they had this MTV, the first MTV movies, uh, production yeah like when they launched the mtv p- pictures yeah was was a like made for mtv movie about drug use in high school um and aaron paul and uh rain phoenix were the stars that's crazy aaron and paul they, breaking bad that's sick yeah 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 so they made a video with him with them and so aaron paul and rain I forgot about that Holy phoenix shit. are in my first video that's right and dude. um yeah yeah and then they had us come and film some sections. That was my first experience with like a music video, and um, and wow. then it won it won like a, it won the MTV Music Video Award that year. So so what does that feel like? And where are you at the like? How big is Dashboard at that time? Right before this was, you feel like it was blowing up, or this just took it to another level? Yeah, it was blown up. Okay, it was blown up. Now I'm like well beyond my, but it was still like. The, it was still like niche and I, and I was okay with that. I, n- I never had this, I, I'd never, it never dawned on me to have the, the narrow, the center lane path. Yeah. Like I always knew I'd be left the center and frankly, I always have been, but for brief periods of time, like yeah. when that was on MTV. And then I think that's been what's given us longevity is that we never were totally mainstream. Mm hmm. But yeah, that was the, the we were big at that point. When I say big, it was like we were, we were, you know, we were being able to sell out places that we, I, I couldn't imagine we had any business selling, you know, like Irving Plaza, things like that that yeah. are like, yeah, that they're like kind of milestones or, or totally. you know, CBGBs and then it wasn't straight to Irving Plaza. It was like a basement show to some crummy club, to CBGB, several crummy clubs, to see brownies, to the CBGBs, brownies. to Bowery, <laughs> yeah. to, and, and to the Bowery, to uh, Irving Plaza, and then, you know, later, on and on. It's cool, man. But at that point, we were probably about the stage of, like, about either just about to or at Irving Plaza size. Yeah, that's great. And then that then the hit, so, and, the, and so did the song, was the song getting radio play? And that's w- that. Why MTV wanted? No, okay. it was getting nothing. Wow, it was getting nothing. It was just there was fans in the building. At wow. that time, there was a whole bunch of people from our scene that were starting to get work within like radio stations gotcha. and within TV shows and within um, and with it at MTV. And yeah. so somebody at MTV was a fan because they were young and they were they were mostly connected to the scene that we all came out of. Yeah, and they they floated it and they stayed on it. They just like were like a uh, dog on a bone, and they they finally got the person person or people in charge to come out and see us, and and that's what it took. It's the it took them seeing the audience in the way they reacted. It's the audience that's yeah the famous. It's not us. Mm-hmm. It's the one the thing that's like the big moment isn't the, the band. It's the audience. It's not me and my guitar. It's the people singing out there. Yeah. So were you, were you did you were you like well, like whatever they come check us out? We used. Did you care about MTV, like sweating you guys at that time, just doing your thing, like whatever happens, happens? And I didn't, 
I didn't know to care. Yeah. I, didn't even, I didn't even know to care at all. Yeah. Um, if I was even told, to be honest with you, um, it's entirely possible I wasn't told. It's most likely probable I wasn't told until afterwards. Okay. Uh, how did this even come about? Oh, they were at this show. They were at that show. Gotcha. Yeah, I never met anybody. I never like, like when we did the MTV Unplugged, that was a different story. I, yeah. The keep the guy. Well, I can get to that. But anyway, with the, um, with the with the movie and getting um, that song on MTV, the first time it dawned on me that this is like some, something that might change my career. Yeah. Was when I was when I was actually filming the video. Yeah. I hadn't spent too much time in California. All of a sudden, I'm spending time in California, and I'm I'm act on a set with makeup on, wow. and I'm filming for for days. And I was like, "Wait a minute! Like I'm in like Hollywood, doing a Hollywood thing <laughs> yeah. here." Yeah, and um, and I and I had terrible fear because I I just you know there's all those all those lessons were taught coming up in the hardcore scene, and then all those lessons were taught by watching these bands sign to majors or get big exposure mm -hmm. and imploding or being forgotten. Yep. Um, everything about it screamed cautionary. Tale. And I was really uncomfortable with alienating our audience. I get, I've been, I get it. Yes. So I, I never got both my, and this is probably if all the things that helped my career, they're incredible. The thing that maybe hurt my career, but maybe gave me a longer career was that I, in other words, I could have probably, po might have possibly been much bigger, but for a shorter period of time, um, which I would have not liked. But if, because I never got both, put, went in with both feet. Mm. I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And I watched other bands come in up after me and around me and, and do that. And there was no backlash. Um, there really, I mean, there wasn't. Yeah. Um, times times had changed. I just wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Or what label you're on? This like that people cared about your label you're on. All that stuff. Like. Yeah, I thought time. that it would. I also thought like because people care about what la label you're on, I was concerned too. Like the backlash. What if that extends to Vagrant Records and the bands on Vagrant Records? Mm. Like, is this is this going to hurt the Get Up Kids? Is this going to hurt Saves the Day or the Trio? is this going to be a smudge and it was it wasn't but these are the yeah. things that like kept me up at night mm. same kind of thing with the, the punk explosion too with epitaph records and fat records at that one point same kind of thing too you know well that's where i come up with a cautionary tale because that's where i learned like this is not good mm -hmm. this can be really good for one or two bands but probably not going to be good for everybody yeah and i felt like i wasn't going to be the one or two I felt like i was going to be the everybody so you made the video, and after that, were you stressing it when it came out, or? Well, I was stressing, but uh, about the things that are so super. You look back and realize they're so superficial. Yeah. I was, of course, stressing about what other people would think. Yep. I just wasn't. I I needed to learn and how to yet yeah, how to just be comfortable with what I thought and what I felt. Mm -hmm. Um, I was really concerned. Like, is this what? What are people going to say? What are people going to say? And it, you know, you realize now, like, what does it matter? You made the choice. Exactly. You did it. You did it. Well, you can't, like, if they have something to say, they have every right to say it. And you can't change your mind. If you didn't want them to say it, don't do it. Yep. But I didn't have that life lesson yet. And, you know, by and large, people, there was, there was a backlash against my band, but it didn't come until later. Okay. And I think the backlash came a little bit more with, like, the ubiquity of the emo scene. Like, everybody thought, like, like, I I never wore gothy makeup or anything like that, mm -hmm. but I was lumped like that came after me. But I was, but that's what people think of. I think when they think of this super sad sack shit and this yeah. very very like goth um, aesthetic and and melodrama. I don't think that's I don't think that applies to us. I'm not passing judgment on that, that scene. I just don't see the relationship between the sounds or the looks yeah. or the ethos. But you know, that's you put in that category. It was about, I did. And I, and I'm ha I like, I like every stage of emo and I'd never have thought I want to be disassociated from it. But there was a point of it where I was like, Oh yeah, maybe this doesn't, the thing they're calling emo doesn't really apply to me anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, like I felt a little like sense of loss because 
you know, this is when I say emo, I'm not talking about the the um, snarky way people say it. I'm talking about the way we said it with pride. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were in that scene, it wasn't any different. It was just a subsect of hardcore for us, totally. which was a subsect of punk rock, which is all a subsect of community. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, but anyway, I digress. The, 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 the thing ended up being great for my life and for my career, for my bandmates. And, um, and so it also ended up being great for my friends, the ones that I was worried about, like, well, what does this do to the Get Up Kids or Saves today? Mm-hmm. Or the Alkaline Trio or all the bands, all the main bands on Vagrant that we were family with. Yeah. Well, they all started making videos, too. And they were, I mean, I think Hey Mercedes made their video, like, the next week with the same people. Oh, wow. And they were all, they were, yeah, they were all, they were all uh, pretty successful in that period in that medium. And they didn't get a whole lot of backlash. Yeah, and you guys so, took that chance and did that first, you know, like, kind yeah. of said it. I, I wish I had been, I wish I had been more uh, in the moment for all those things. Mm. So worried about what people might do or what people might think or what will this, what will this take away? Yeah. Or God forbid, like, what if this adds something I don't want? And he's like, man, sometimes if you're going to take a risk, you're just going to have to shed all that and just say what will come will come yeah did you see a difference at the shows and fans and people after yeah. that yeah i did yeah 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 definitely um and it was it would change more and more and then change back later mm-hmm. but right away i saw like I, I really don't know what to call them but i saw this like way more diversity in the kinds of people that were coming it just yeah. wasn't strictly like these hardcore emo kids yeah it was it was people I couldn't identify what their story was just by looking at their T-shirt, mm-hmm. and that's all okay. You know, I would come to know these people as like having the same. We were just their entry point for some yeah. reason, and that's fine. Dude. And that's they a good would, thing, man. Yeah, they had the same heart and head for for what we were after. Yeah, in our scene, so, and it would get more. I feel like there was a point though. The one thing that I that I couldn't control was I think there was a point where like. There were so many of the new folks to the scene that the scene kids kind of maybe felt pushed out a little bit. Yeah, we found it. We, we found them first. I, I, does, yeah. there, there is this thing where like I never understood it because we we saw bands like Seven Seconds. There's a lot of bands that took chances and went to major labels, and you know we got kind of bored with making the same record over again. We, we wanted to be who we were, but try something different. Went to MCA, New Found Glory was on, The Blink was on. We took a chance, made a record that people love and cherish now, but back then they hated it. We were sellouts, this and that, even though we were the same fucking people. Um, but like, there's this thing where like, punk, punk and hardcore kids, like they have you, and then the minute you become a little bit successful, they hate you because they want you to play the five kids in their basement. We found them first. Like, they're not yours. We, you know, they don't want to share you with other people. And the whole point of your band is to get your message to everybody you can, inspire as many people as you can, all kinds of people, not just from your small little scene. And there's this thing where, like, people get so uh, selfish about kind of feel like they own you. And then the minute, like, pe- more people like you, they feel like, ah, oh, fuck them. They sold out. But it's, but it's not. You're the same person and you have an opportunity to get your message on a bigger platform. And I never understood that, like, you would want to support bands that you love and inspired you on all the different journeys. Do you know what I mean? I totally know what you mean, but I have to tell you that I was guilty of that as a music fan. Mm. You know, I, I know I was. You know, I'm not now. I'm, I'm, I'm older, and I know what's, like, what's loved is to be shared, you know? Yeah. But when I was younger, I was like, well, you know, we're the outcasts. And we, we, we feel like we help, you know, you get this sense of like, you're part of something where well, you can't help but feel like you're helping too. And like, and it's not like this band wouldn't be there without us, but you do feel like, oh, we help them get bigger and bigger by telling so many people to come with us. Like literally, you got to come with us to see this show. So there's 10 more people at this show the last time because I brought those 10. And so of course I feel like, oh, you know, this is how I felt. Of course I feel like, you know, like, what, what's happening now? Who are these folks? And what about us? And oh, man, I'm not, I can't, I don't know if I can be, I can't hang with this. And that was, that was foolishness in my youth. You know, I can't um, share them with these people. Who are these people? I don't know these people. Well, so, but then from a band point of view, like being on the stage, it was more like euphoria because what you said, it rings true when you're in the band. It's like what you're doing, you want to be spread to people far and wide. You don't care. 
if they come from your scene. In fact, if you can spread your music, your message beyond your scene, it already is buying in your message because it's part of, it's their message too. Um, then you're doing something special, right? Yeah. You, I mean, you can't preach to preach to the converted the whole, all the time. I, I loved opening up for new founder, doing the warp tour or playing with some 41 or good, good Charlotte. I love that challenge of being that band that nobody really knew who they were and winning the crowd over and working. I, I love that. I'm like, that's the whole point of music of that getting in front of different audiences and spreading your word. I mean, I love hardcore and punk. That's my roots. And that's the people that, that made us. And that's how I grew up. But people got so mad when we started like playing with other bands that weren't in the scene. And it's like, and then later on more things happened like that. More hardcore bands got on the warp tour and, and there was more diverse packages, but like, yeah, you broke down that wall though for bands to be able to do that. So you felt the brunt of like the resistance that other bands didn't feel. So I'm wondering how that felt to you. Like when you would go back to your scene and now you're those fans you made along the way outside your scene or at your shows. What did you, how did you feel about that personally? No, I, I, I love, I, I was bummed when we lost kids, when we took it, when we took a chance doing a major label record, I was bummed that people didn't, re- didn't realize all they saw was like, we were on Cone O'Brien and you were on MCA records. They didn't even listen to the lyrics. The lyrics were exactly the same. Maybe the record me personally, I didn't like the way it sounded. It was too polished and I wish I had more part of it. My head wasn't in it when I was doing that whole major label thing. Was I let my brother Todd and Rusty kind of take the reins, and I kind of don't regret it, but I wish I was more involved in the writing process, and that's on me. But we were the same dudes. I was still a straight edge vegan. We were on Conan O'Brien wearing Madball and Scarhead shirts. John Joseph was in the audience. I was X'd up. Like we was we was so about our roots and where we came from. We wanted to represent that to the fullest on a different platform. That yeah, when we lost some kids, it sucked, but they came back, and you know after a while like. Like, oh, the record's not bad, but th- that one second they hear even left Epitaph was sell us. They wrote us off before they even heard the record. They reviewed the record yeah. before they even heard it. So then, fast forward, we had a hiatus from the Go record. We made nothing to prove. And for us, that was the, that's my most favorite record ever. Actually, today's anniversary of that record. It's my favorite record. I wrote every lyric on it. And that for us, I guess that's our comeback record because it was like an eight-year gap in between. And the hardcore kids were there. They, was, they, they were there for us. And People love that record then, now, but back then it was just like, like you said, like we found them first. And, and I love and appreciate all the kids who at the first shows that stay with us until now. But it's like at the same time, like we, were, we didn't want to make the same record over and over again. Like as us being trying to be creative and, and being happy with what we were making, we wanted to be happy first. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, so can't, like you can't do both. And you can't There's please, no way to you do can both. never please everybody. You can't. So yeah, it you was... Can't. I was sad when I saw shit people wrote about us. That was when the message boards first kicked off. And at the same time, I learned, like, you know what? Fuck it, man. Punk rock taught us. Just like you. you you're a punk rock kid, and you play an acoustic guitar on the Snapcase H2O. That's punk as fuck. Whether it sounded like it, or you looked like it, or at that moment, people didn't get it. It was still you being yourself. And that for us, we prided ourselves on being ourselves, staying true to ourselves, not being afraid to let people know we love you too and Madonna and Sade and this other types of music. Like, fuck it. And so I feel like that's kind of helped our longevity also is as people know that this is who we are. We're never taking ourselves too seriously. We're not the best musicians. We're about the music and the message and we live the lyrics on and off stage and fuck it. It's the best we can. It's, it's us. And so that was really hard. But looking back at it now, like nobody would ever say shit to your face. Ever. And no, those same kids no. who were dissing you on the internet were probably at your show during that time. You know, it's, I don't know. It's a hard spot. So, I mean, I, I was stoked when, like, see, having you, see, remember you on that tour, like, holy shit, this is the same kid fucking on MTV. I was so stoked. And then fast forward to Vindicated, Spider Man, those are my favorite movies. You know, like, you being in that, that, that was huge, man. I was like, holy shit. This handsome yeah, that motherfucker. Was small shit. It was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy, but I knew. But I knew he came from hardcore, and I always loved when people came from our world, and 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 went to different places with it. Man, I don't know. I just, I always loved that and supported that. I never thought there was anything wrong with that, man. Like, I don't know. I mean, I yeah, mean, uh, I would. Ahead. I would say, I say, in all fairness, I would say, let's be honest. I guess, like now, we know that the majority of the people supported us. It's yes. just the minority of people with with can sometimes have the loudest voice, and even if they don't, whatever voice they have, it can sting, and it really can sting. 
Yeah, even now, like even if like with the internet and shit, like you have like a thousand amazing comments and then one negative one, and I'll be it would just it would just bother my wife's like who gives a fuck? It's like one person you're never gonna see in your life makes one negative comment and it sticks with you. It really because you care and you're so passionate about what you put out in the world and because you live it and this is your livelihood and this is what you believe, just the one little thing, like a one message board back then, like you just it would just eat at you, but in, in the grand scheme of life, it doesn't mean anything, dude. It doesn't matter, man. You know? No, like, but it can serve. It can serve to remind you that, like, it can serve to remind you, like, these. If you're still affected by some negative comment, it just means you're still trying, and that's. I think there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's a, a one point plus too. you can take away from that. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Because I get, I get pretty, I get pretty down about a negative comment, and I don't get so many of them, uh, you know, compared to other bands, and especially compared to like, you know, we're our the emo section of our scene are like can kind of be the, uh, that it's easy to put a tar hit the target on that one. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't, it's, we, we get, we get a lot of, we get a, we have a lot of support. So much love. But when those, when those, when you get those ones that don't show love and it, it's, it's, it's hard not, it's, I think because we're artists and we're, we have serious, we're serious about the ethics we have also. And we're, we also, I think like you and I are two people that have like a real sense of, of justice in general, mm -hmm. what's right and what's wrong. And so when somebody hits that justice or injustice button, it just like, it's, it, there's no halfway. It's just on max. Yeah. It hits you on max, no matter what. It's crazy. Like even like I'm 50, like you're 45 and 50 where we're parents, we're doing this for like over 20 years. Yeah. It's just like little things. I don't know why I don't, and you shouldn't take it personal, especially from somebody you don't even know. But like, yeah, it's a sting, it's, it does sting a little bit. And but you know, but at that point, you think about all the all the positive and the good things you've done. And this one person just wants your attention. Who freaking knows why? But my wife's always like, "Yo, you're a little pussy. Fucking move on." My wife calls me out all the yeah. time. Who, who cares? Yeah, and, and they're right. You know, when my when my wife does that too, they're they're, <laughs> they're right. They're right. And like we know that, like we would say the same thing if, to our kids. Yeah. But when it's us. Man, so it feels like it's only ever happened to us. Only you know us. I mean? There's no. Yeah. There's, you can share share the spirit of po uh, positivity with everybody. Yes. You don't really want to share the spirit of cruelty yes. with everybody. <laughs> you just kind of like you just put your arms around it and let's like you're hopping on a grenade. Oh, I'm gonna be the only one to feel this, and no one has ever felt this before. I'm gonna feel it all. Yeah. And it sucks. Yeah. But hey, you know that's part of the. Our, I think that's part of the um, artistic mindset. It's just what it is. Yeah, so getting around it. So, so infidelities blew up. Now you guys are the biggest you've ever been at that, correct? Yep. And then you tore on that record for quite a while before the Spider-Man soundtrack, correct? That's two thousand four. Yeah. So we 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 had uh, we made. Um, let's see. There was. Let's see. Was there? Somebody okay, so it goes that? like this. So we had we had yeah we had um, screaming fidelities. It goes on and just like it's starting to happen. I mean, it's happening like kind of like wildfire. And in that time, I I wrote what was called the So Impossible EP, which is which has an acoustic version of of Hands Down, which gotcha. would later become one of our biggest songs. And on that that whole experience was incredible. On that um, record, Dan from Sunny Day came and joined me to to play guitar, like extra guitar, like ornamental guitar, I guess lead guitar. For what it's worth, you know, it's an acoustic record. I don't mean yeah. like raging solos. No. But, you know, real beautiful, circuitous playing, really beautiful stuff yeah. that he plays. And um, and he's on a tour with us. So you gotta, I think I'm like looking to my right, and there's a dude from Sunny Day. It's awesome. <laughs> what are you kidding me? And you know, super <laughs> cool, cerebral guy who who taught me a lot of taught me a lot real quick about like what you're in for in the music business because he'd been for a ride, you know, yeah. Sunny Day real estate. And then. Um, and then we go into uh, uh, Dan was just in for a, for a, you know a few months of like basically a vacation I guess, and um, but then we go then the band goes in now I have a band lineup and we go in to make um, a Mark Commission a brand of Scar which is our third record and the first one that has like electric guitars, nice. and hands down is on there and that blows up, I mean it really blows up, and so that was already bigger like, than screaming it already had a thing. Say again? Bigger than screaming. Bigger than screaming. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, you know, like screaming was bigger on MTV. Okay. I mean, that's the big, 
that and Vindicator were the big ones on MTV. Yeah. But hands down, it, it definitely it definitely moved the ticker on okay. MTV for sure. But what it really did was like it was there our galvanizing moment between two scenes. It was like the further part of the scene and the dashboard part of the scene yep. kind of came together in that moment. And we saw fans come back. It's, awesome. it's strange because it was our biggest sounding record. And I know people wanted just another acoustic record, by the way, which is what they're going to get next, mm-hmm. finally. But um, <laughs> but that they wanted that since the since I made those first two records. And I didn't I didn't do that, but I but they all kind of came back for this because somehow I found the great middle ground without trying. It's awesome. And that 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 album went platinum. I mean, I can't wow. I can't even conceive of that. You know, like it's on Vagrant Records. Wow. Um, they had a partnership at that point with Interscope, which is a major. Yeah. Um, and so they had an ability to literally an ability uh, an ability to literally make more of, uh, you know copies of the of the yeah. CD. Yeah which they didn't have before. And they were able to have this great distribution chain. And so our records actually for the first time in these stores. Oh, wait, hold on. In between those, I made, I did the MTV unplugged. Oh shit. So that was, that was a, that was probably the biggest where screaming was like a great setup. Yep. The, the script, the MTV unplugged. That's, that's what in, that's what gave us the career we have right now. Another level like house. Yeah. Yeah, because we were the first. A couple things happened. We were the first band to do it. They had canceled. They had stopped making the show. Okay. And I don't think they'd made it in maybe ten years or something like that. Maybe it was less. I'm not quite sure. But they brought the show back essentially for us. And this is all because the guy who created the show just came to see us. Nice. Like, and while he was there, he was like, I, "I'm going to do another one, and we're, it's going to be this," because what he saw with the way our crowd was singing along. Yep. His name's Alex Coletti. Alex Coletti, amazing guy. Um, what Alex saw with that in our audience was what he'd always hoped he'd see in the audience of of the Pearl Jam one and the never, and and Nirvana and every 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 one of them. Now these are yeah. all performances that the poor performances of those bands eclipse ours. But I think our audience participation eclipses everybody's. That's yeah. what Alex would always been hoping for. Huge sing-alongs, yeah. And he just yeah, so he just he revived the thing. We're the only, I think we're still the only non-platinum band to ever be on MTV Unplugged. Wow. And we were, awesome. we were seriously not platinum. I mean, I don't even think we had a, maybe we sold a hundred thousand, which is like indie, indie platinum. Yeah, you that's know? huge. Back yeah, for sure. Uh, um, but the, and then that fucking thing went platinum because that's the power of that moment of, wow. of this guy as a television producer, like making sure that whatever magical thing happens at any time is the thing he puts in the show. So he had just incredible foresight and, and without him, I don't think we would have then gone on to make our uh, Mark mission had hands down now, which would become like the calling card for us. Like we have never not closed with that song since it came out in 2003. Wow. Actually it came out on that EP in 2002. So instead, and since 2002, I don't think we've not closed with it. And then, and that uh, says a lot. Yeah, it's huge. And then right on the heels of that, you know, like, we're, we're in there and we're like about to like choose the second single because we thought we're whoever knew there was such a thing as second singles. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And um, that's when, that's when the Spider-Man thing happened. And so I wrote vindicated. Wow, man. And they chose that as the single was supposed to be. Um, Audio slave was, I think supposed to be the, the single. And I don't know whatever happened with that. Maybe they didn't deliver the song or chose to opt out, or maybe it's on there. I don't actually know. How'd that come uh, to you? But like I, how that? So here it is again, man. It's our seed. So a woman named Leah Volick is the, or was the head of music for Sony Pictures. Okay. So I met Leah at CBGB's when I played. Holy shit. And she still lived in New York at that time. And she was awesome. And I didn't know what she did. I was just like, this, this woman is awesome. She's like a grown up, but she's like, she just started talking to her. And she's like, you know, lo and behold, she used to, she toured doing front of house for Richard Hell. Okay. For years. So I'm like, Small Oh, so world, she's yeah. like a for real punk rocker. Yeah. And then she's in this position of being able to make choices like that. And she liked our band and she was liked our scene. And she put some other bands like taking back Sunday That's awesome. on the soundtrack. And, and she, you know, 
said, do you want to see the movie before it's done? And I was like, fuck yes. <laughs> and I went and I went to Sony, Sony Pictures and I watched the movie. And the song I'd given her, you know, it wasn't Tempt In, no music was in there or anything like that. It wasn't Vindicated. I gave her a different song first. Okay. And um, I watched the movie. It was really exciting to see this thing because, you know, it was for a guy that grew up on comic books. Yeah. You know, I was watching Spider-Man 2, which is inarguably one of the best, if not the best, superhero movies ever made. Is that Tobey Maguire, and, right? Um, yeah. Killed it. Yeah. It's the one with Doc Ock and stuff. Yeah. And um, but, the, but the effects weren't finished. So you'd see like these completely rendered C CGI effects suddenly morph into just animation because they weren't done. There was all these placeholders. I can't believe I got to see it that way. So, it's so cool. cool. Yeah, it's so cool. And... Um, and I left and we st she's like, this is great. You know, it won't be the single, but you're on the soundtrack. I was st stoked. What more do you want? Yeah. I went to, went to do my shows. I did some in Australia, did some in Japan. And then we ended the whole year or the, that whole tour in, in Hawaii. We had a couple of days. We were going to go surfing on the last day. Um, last day off, we had like three days off and then we had our two shows. And on the last day off, we were going surfing and I never got to, I never actually got to the beach because I woke up and I just spilled up vindicated. And then I demoed it all on my like really crummy old Pro Tools rig. Nice. And I sent it to her. I'm like, I, it's probably too late, uh, but I think this would be a better song for the for the movie. Um, and I uh, let me know what you think. She called me back two hours. She's like, can you record a better demo of this? I said, sure. So when we got to the oh, sound check, we recorded it right off the desk. Just played it live. I sent it to her again. She called me that night and she said, this is the single now. We'll have nice. you in the studio on Tuesday. And uh, just uh, our only request is you do not change a note. I just got goosebumps. I, That's so crazy. Yeah, it was wild. And so the only <laughs> thing that we did, and like in typical, typical like punk rock, well, she said we couldn't change a note. We we're going to change a note. <laughs> oh, shit. So we, we changed like <laughs> one note and we changed the, the, the uh, there's there's what there's one note that starts off the bridge. It was a different chord. Okay. And we changed that one. I don't know why we would do that, by the way. But we just like some of that shit, <laughs> so country and shit, just is so ingrained <laughs> in you. I was like, they're giving us the keys to the kingdom here, but they said uh, one condition: don't change anything of the work you did, yeah. like your thing. We don't want you to change it. Oh yeah, well I'll show you. <laughs> so we changed the one one note, did and it, they didn't notice. They didn't notice, yeah. And uh, until now. And they, Go and, ahead. Yeah, and but I couldn't believe it when they when she said like, yeah, we want this song. I was like, great, I'm psyched. She's like, and it's a single, and I was like, what? And Holy I could shit. see, man, I could see like, my life's not gonna change, but no one will ever be able to take that away from me. It's massive, dude. Holy! And so, do you remember the first time you saw the movie? Did you go see the theater yeah, with yeah. the song in there? I saw it in the premiere. So wow. we went to the, the premiere in L.A. and and uh, I remember we were like sitting with like the actors, but like the the Maroon 5 guys were behind us. And this is before they were like the giant pop sensation, Huge, yeah. you know, um, they were just, they were pretty new. They had some hits and all that stuff, but they were pretty, they were, they're actually really nice guys. We've toured with them a couple I of times. I heard that. Yeah. Um, they're, they're really super nice guys. And, uh, but it was, it felt good. Like I could turn around, like when the, when, when the, song swells in there's like a swell of a guitar sound i just felt this hand on my two hands on on my shoulders and it was it, one hand was james and the other was adam and they like just kind of like leaned in there like you did it buddy i was like yeah. all right you know i didn't really know those guys at all but yeah. it was just like it was a cool attaboy from somebody else yeah it's awesome who i knew understood the importance of like having a break like that in your mm -hmm. in your career had anybody and heard the song yet did it only come out in the movie first or it came out it came out, did it? Uh, well, so what happened was it wasn't out. Okay. No, no, no. So hold on. No one had seen it at the previews. Okay. And when it was done, it, like when it came on, I was cer certainly excited. But when the people around us started talking about the song, not knowing who we were, and they were being psyched, I was like, ooh, this could, this, maybe I did, maybe like we actually got away with one here. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it, it was in a, it went on sale as the pre preview to the trailers came out. So it was on TV and that was like kind of better than radio because, you know, like maybe the video would get, wasn't going to be out until the movie was out, but it was all over 
MTV anyway because it was in the ads. That's insane. And um, and people were buying it on iTunes, and then we were because iTunes was a big thing then, you know. Yep. And then we went and then we went out on the road, and it ended up like real quickly becoming like this, you know, set ender, you know, a big point of a position of 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 power in this in the in the set list, you know, before you walk off stage. It was just immediate. It was just one of those songs. Like even if it had been in Spider Man, it was going to galvanize yeah. in our live show. Was it charting and stuff audiences. too on the Billboard and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Wow, um, man! It was uh, at that point. It became our highest charting song. Wow, man! So that's like three in a row, man. Holy shit! Yeah, and that was that. I mean, we had like one or two like really poorly performing singles after that, and that was the end of us at radio. Since then. I mean, we've had like, yeah, since then, I think we've had, we've had this great, incredible career. Yeah, that of no course. Long, just like in the beginning, does just to mirror the beginning of it, we have this incredible career in spite of really not being on the radio. Yeah, it may, yeah it's all, yeah, that's like, that was what it's all about for us growing up too, like the underground, all that. It's amazing. Yeah, so you like. Which, I, which I'll take any day. Yeah. So that, 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 that put you guys in like main, that was pretty much mainstream. Right? That's mainstream. It's Spider-Man movie, man. It's everywhere. That's me. That's mainstream. Yeah, there's no two ways about that. So that's that was a hype. That was like almost like household name in a sense during that. When the, all the it's crazy, man. It's just it's crazy. Right. Dude. So that that's when you start playing these things like these radio festivals. You know, oh like yeah. The, the uh, like the, the jaunt in the park and things with weird names like the kerfuffle and things like that. You know, um, the radio stations put on their summer and winter festivals that aren't the same in any way to the Europe festivals we're all used to. Yep. And, um, and I had to call Chad Gilbert and be like, what do I, what do I do for these? Sick like, oh, out, man, basically you grip it and rip it and get mm. out of there. And so that was like helpful to know, like, oh, okay, we can, we can go up there. Good Charlotte guys. I called them and like, what do we do? And we're at these things. They're like, Oh, nothing. You do your show. Was well, like you and guys are like, radio oh, so bands. You guys in radio, like top, like big bands and stuff. Like top 40 yeah, bands. yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like we're playing with like Coldplay. Oh and, uh, shit, really? Things like that. So Dang. yeah, so like we like we have no business being there whatsoever. And um and you you know, what do you like I didn't know what to do. And and I was like, okay, so cool. So how do you so and I'd be like, so you know, in my classic fashion of like every show counts, I'm like, so how do you win them over then? Like what's what where where what do you find in yourself, guys? And they're like, Oh, nothing. You, you don't win them over. Like what? Yeah, yeah, they're they're here for the they're they're here for the beer, the free T shirt, um, and the one band they think is cool. And um, like you just you know the radio station will be happier here. You'll be happier here. You'll be surprised how much fun it could be. And um, like just take that thing off your shoulders. Like you're not going to win them over. Wow. And did and, they, did they and sing? You know what? I don't think you do. <laughs> did they just sing that one song? You go out and you sing like three songs sometimes. Sometimes you have a full set. Yeah. Plenty of times you have a full set, but there's a, the ones that are weird are the ones where you're like, okay, we're like, we've got 15 minutes. And it's like the early days, that's fine. Yeah. But, but here you've got 15 minutes, but they want your full production or a Jeez. full production. Yeah. So, you know, you've got like big video screens or light screens and you've got, you've got uh, incredible lighting and you've, you're supposed to get your, you know, the, the best sounds and like everything's mic'd up perfectly and the whole thing, but you have three minutes to set up and 15 minutes play and three minutes of breakdown. Jesus so like, how do you do it? Yeah. You know? And like, we're still like doing the setup ourselves in that day. Like we didn't really get a full road crew, crew until after we probably after we needed it, you know, well, after yeah. we needed it. that's insane, man. That's like, this it seems like those things happen pretty fast. Like, 2002 to 2004 all that it was just those three years was like all the big songs man it's crazy man man it was a learning experience for sure there was every there was a lesson every day It was hard to keep up it was we were exhausted i was exhausted i i never went home i i went home um every year every year for three years i was home from probably december 15th to january 15th maybe and wow. then back out again were you married then or anything or no no, I was like I had a just a, a condo that my me and my brother lived in. Nice. Uh, my brother Nick and I lived in, and uh, that that was kind of, that was it. That was my that was my life, you know. Yeah. So it was okay. Yeah. It was okay to be gone like that. And my my place was covered because my brother was there. Yeah. Um, I missed my friends like crazy. I was pretty much single for the at that time. 
Married to the Road. Beginning at that time. Yeah. Married to the Road, and I, I didn't know much else. I was I was losing touch with my friends, which I didn't like. Um, but but they made a huge effort in understanding the bizarre nature of my daily clock, and yeah. uh, and they stayed they stayed committed, like uh, you know kept calling, kept calling, good friends, you know. Yeah. Did it feel and surreal things, during those times? Yeah. 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 That whole that whole thing is a washy memory. Mm-hmm. And, um, it it's a good memory for the most part, but I was tired. I was probably cranky. I wonder if I had some bad days where people were like, "Oh, that guy wasn't cool." Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure I did because I, I don't think I've found too many things that were exa- as exhausting in my life as those t- couple of years. Yeah. Uh, did you enjoy? But, you know, you were, did you have fun while you loved it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I, I'm a, I'm addicted to the work. I'm addicted to work in general. Yeah. Um. But I, I liked, I liked that, this work more than I can imagine liking any other work. So mm-hmm. yeah, I enjoyed it, and like you know, there wasn't any time to like relish in the. Hey, look, let's face it. Like, I, there's some people that like, the the music is cool, and the being on the stage is cool, and all that stuff. But it's all the stuff that happens after the show that's amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the 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 people flocking to you, the 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 substances you might get, rock into, and roll, or, yeah, like, sh- vibes. adventures that you might have, and all for me it was like every part of the day before and after were incidental, but the show was was the. I agree. Was, there's nothing going to beat this period of my nothing. day ever. I agree. The- so I, I savored it. <laughs> That's awesome. And did you feel like you, did it did it get to your head like not 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 feeling like you were huge to get your head mentally like like what's happening? Holy shit! Or were you, were you scared? Were you nervous? Or you felt like oh shit, this is? Did you feel like th- this is how it's going to be for like forever? This is my career now. Like I'm anything like that? Or I think that like I, I thought here was the big mistake I had in thinking. I thought if we got a little bigger, things would get easier. Mm. I thought we were like I thought things were so hard because we were still on this grind. Yeah. And and I didn't want to get bigger. Like I never was never before that did I have this like oh if we just could be bigger. Like yeah. I was always happy with where we were, and all I wanted to do was have the chance to earn more fans. But that didn't necessarily in my head like I didn't connect those dots to being a bigger band. Yeah. I thought that meant having more people at the shows, gotcha. but that's not what I meant by a bigger band. Yeah, I thought if we were a bigger band, like maybe something like the Killers, that we're just like everybody knows about them, and they're like yeah, everything's you know the show you're going to get is going to be perfect, and mm-hmm. and and it's going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And we did get big; we got like arena size. It's crazy, man. You know, we sold out Madison Square Garden. Wow! But you know, coming from CBGBs and below CBGBs, Insane. you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and Damn. um, and you know, our first New York play was in Hicksville. Way still- uh, okay, that doesn't count. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I know Hicksville really You ever take well. a train out to Hicksville, bro? That's a <laughs> long train. Um, so, you know, the, the, the truth was that I thought that, you know, now the next step is getting even bigger and then all this strain of work that is keeping me from having any kind of life at all will go away and I'll be able to have all the things. I'll be able to have reaching more people but have time to actually connect with the people too. Yep. And that's not the case, man. It just didn't – well, and it didn't happen. And two, there is no, there is no having both by getting bigger. There's lose, there's just losing more and more mm-hmm. of the of the other part. Yeah, you just you're just bigger, and there's more demand. So now I've I've like I instead I, I found a way to reel it back some, and um, some is through choice, and some is through time. You know. Yeah. And and now I have like, yeah, we, our shows are something that I can enjoy every piece of from the moment I wake up to the moment I collapse in bed after this exhausting day. And I never miss, a, I almost never miss a call or a text or, or a DM or anything like that now mm-hmm. from my friends because yeah, I love that. Because I found that I found the balance. I, I, and I couldn't have had a family. I couldn't have had a marriage. I couldn't have had these things during that time. I, it would have, I would have had to have stopped or, I mean, one of the two of the things was going to, was going to collapse if I had tried to do it at the same time. Yeah. We, we live in Florida this whole time. During all that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I moved to New York. Uh, no, I was living in New York, I guess, about halfway through. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, New- Brooklyn, Manhattan? I lived in uh, like the West Village. Nice. Like in Greenwich Village. 
And so when did you end up moving to Nashville? So let's see. I've lived here for six, let's see, five, at least six years, maybe seven years. Did you come, you went from New York to Nashville? No, I went back to Florida first. Oh, nice. Um, I wanted to reconnect with the further guys. It's awesome. Um, Your roots. It's one awesome. of my, I had a ailing family member that we thought we needed to be close to. Gotcha. Um, and so, uh, and I, I felt, you know, the, but this is the slowdown I need. I need, yeah. to, I need to back up off the road. I need to not make a record for a while. That while ended up being like eight years, kind of like you guys did. Yeah, you know, yeah. That big gap. Yeah. I, I didn't expect that. Man, I really didn't expect that. But it turns out you just you, 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 sometimes you you need you don't expect what you need. Yeah, I, I agree. Get re inspired, all made, that de decompress from the road, all that. Yeah, I was gonna just make some fabricate, you know, like some facsimile of 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 the kind of records I made before instead of something that I actually felt value of. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I moved down to Florida for a couple of years and um, enjoyed reconnecting with my home and yeah. and um reconnecting with my people and then then we all started talking about nashville together um between you know chad chad was living in la with you yep um and he was talking about moving here and then two of the further guys were talking about moving here and a couple more guys and then we've then the some guys from out of town like bayside and saves some of the saves the day guys yep. some of the offspring guys yep um they are were talking about moving here. Even the corn guys were talking about moving here, who I didn't know, but I knew through nice. people. And um, and I was like, oh wait a minute. So I I think I would do well in a community that is 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 uh, populated by people that do this kind of work. Yeah. That understand like, hey, that guy's going to be gone for two months, but when he's back, he's back, and we'll just pick up right then because mm -hmm. that's what they do too. Yeah. And then like one one thing I find about being here is that it's not just musicians that have that kind of strange factor in their life of so much travel because there's a lot of insurance here and people have to tra travel a lot and these big insurance companies and then Nissan's headquarters are here and they have to go back to Japan like the most of the staff have to go once or twice a year for extended periods gotcha so so it's not at all like abnormal for like a friend you know even if he's not in your in our in our world mm -hmm. to just like kind of have to like pick up and go and you're not going to see him for a month or her for a month. Yeah. And, um, and they, so they, so, so, you know, the, the fact that I was like picking up and moving, but with my network of friends to a place that we're going to understand our lifestyle a little bit better. Yeah. I, it, it was a great move. I mean, we, awesome. we heavily considered California, but the fact that my friends in California, like Chad, we're all going to move here. I was like, well, that's halfway. <laughs> Might yeah. as well just go there first and see how it works. Yeah, I hear great things about Nashville, man. So many great things. It is pretty great. You miss? Do you miss Florida? Do you miss New York? Or yeah, anything? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think to be quite honest, I miss New York more than I miss anything. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to not be there after having lived there, and I'm a northeasterner at heart, no matter what. Yep. Uh, I'm like a tri-state kid. Yeah. Um, but. Um, as a matter of fact, I think when all is said done, I'll probably end up there. But I miss Florida. I'm there a lot. My family's there, so yeah. my mom and my brother are there. So I'm I'm there a lot. Um, if my friends hadn't grown had had if more of my friends had grown up and stayed there, I'm, I'm sure I'd probably end up. I probably would have had a tougher time leaving. But yeah. when I got back, most of them were gone to different points. You know, everybody mm -hmm. spreads out. Yeah, that's the way it goes. And then when 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 did you become a, a dad? Um, I, let's see. Who can even remember? <laughs> How many kids you have? Uh, I've got two kids. I've got You're a boy nice. and a girl. Awesome. It's amazing, right? It's the best thing, man. It really is truly the best thing. And they're, uh, they're, they're fascinating people. These yeah. kids, you know, mm -hmm. watching them grow up and trying to guide them through life and try not to fuck them up. Totally. Seems like a, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty it's the hardest job you're ever gonna have and it's the best one it is man it's yeah it's life-changing everything every day is something different the different chapter i might only have one but like the different chapters ages and just everything you talk about and just everything is just 
Yeah, it's my son's 17 now. It's, he's an L.A. kid, and I like, grew up in Hollywood. It's weird because I'm from the East. Moon's from Midwest. It's just balancing all that, you know? Yeah, it's – it's. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty lucky with these kids that they're, like, they don't – they have an appreciation for the way I grew up, even though they're brought up differently. Yes. Yes. And I'm, 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 luck, I'm lucky for that. You know, we've gr- driven by the apartment building I grew up in and stuff, and they're like, wow, that's where you lived? And I'm like, yeah. Like, wow, like, so, what? you know, like, tell us about, you know, trying to explain, like, how my brothers and I, like, rotated in it. We only had, there's three of us, but only two beds. Yeah. So, so we had to, like, yeah. rotate who got to sleep on the, had to sleep on the floor, and we had a schedule and the whole bit, you know. And, um, you know, it's just, like, they're, they're re- that, that reality isn't their reality, but they're not, like, entitled or anything like that. We're just, like, hey, man, we're just... I think people have this misconception of people of, of, of anybody that has no, some, some success in the public forum, like, mm-hmm. like I have, but you know, we're just like, we're showbiz middle-class, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, there's this, we're not these, there, there's no jet in, on my <laughs> pro- <laughs> property. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, I don't mean to say that we're like living some vaulted life. It's just compared to what I came up in. It's, it's, yeah. it's a better situation for them. Yeah. But I, I was always worried that like, Oh man, like, do you need the hardships to come up? And you know what? It turns out life hands you just enough shit, no matter what your circumstances Agreed. are, that you're going to, you're going to find a way to be a powerful thinker and affect change in, in, in the world. Yeah, do you feel like being a punk rock kid like definitely helped you as far as like how, how your parenting is too, is like your ethics and your beliefs? And, oh yeah, 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 totally. Oh yeah, like I mean, it, like it, it, there's no question that like when you know when we were talking earlier, I was talking about how you know the scene big brothers and sisters, you know, like yes. the people that were just a few years older than you, you looked up to, right? But then it was your turn. Yeah, you know, you became like a scene kind of elder, mm-hmm. you know, at at seventeen, you know, whatever yeah. it is, you know, and <laughs> And you're like Old fostering school. the next, you're, yeah, you're fostering like the next group and the way that they're going to think about stuff. And, mm-hmm. and you're trying to give them the best, inf- all the best information so that they can make the best, best choices. But you learn real quick that you can't make their choices for them. Yeah. And, and you shouldn't, and you shouldn't. And that's, I think, something that, uh, that I took from there directly to parenting. Yeah. Are you a strict parent? Yeah. I'm, um, well, it, no, I mean, there's not like crazy rules and stuff like yeah. that. But there's, there's this sense of respect in this household mm-hmm. uh, that's mutual all over the place. So I love that. I think we're the the kids have never put me in a position where I have to be um, egregiously strict. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm willing to if they do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Were your were your parents like that too or no? Uh, my mom was. See, here's the thing, man. My mom, like, I was grounded for, like, years if I didn't, like, I literally was grounded for, like, my whole, I think, sophomore year. Maybe it was my junior year. And it's just all based on, based on grades. Damn. My behavior was fine, but I, like, I was slacking at school. Once I turned that around, it's fine. And if I wasn't grounded, I had no curfew. I had That's awesome. no rules that said I couldn't go out at night. Mm-hmm. I had to have a job. I had to have good school. I had to have good grades. That's and it. she was then confident that I would make better. I'd make good diso- decisions with my life. And she trusted. And she you. gave me. A, mm-hmm. She trusted me. She showed me that trust. She gave me a lot of, a lot of rope. And I was, I was real intent on not losing that trust. And I loved. I think that she was great in that. And I borrowed that from her, my mom. Awesome. I think she was great in in understanding the power that trust gives the person who's being trusted. Yeah. Like, this is this is my thing to win or lose. Yeah. And, and, and I was, I was, um, I had so much freedom. I mean, I was able to go all these shows. I mean, I was like, you know, I think I was 16 on my first tour and I, so cool. she had to sign like a conservatorship over to the yeah. guy in the band. It was over 21. So I could go across state lines. <laughs> that and I was too, like, I you think. know, yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah. And I couldn't go in the bars mm-hmm. to actually play or if there was a bar in the venue, I could not go in until we played Yeah, and then had to leave which meant I didn't have to load anything. So that was cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just had to pack the van. But anyway, you know, the, and you know, like I was like, that was, I, I remember saying to my mom, like that's genius. You know, that was a genius bit of parenting because it gave me this real world experience yeah. and so on, so, so, off, and so on and so, so on. And she's like, yeah, but also like 
I didn't have to deal with you for a whole summer. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so she bought herself a vacation from her pain in the ass son, you know? Yeah, but she trusted you. So it, you, you saw in, like you're in the skateboarding and this weird punk rock music that looks really crazy from an outside perspective unless you're involved in it. But to have that trust to be able to go on tour and be involved in that music, it's pretty awesome. It shows what kind of relationship you have with your mom. That's it's awesome. Yeah. She also like would dive headlong into the music too, which I don't think a lot of parents will do. She listened to it? So like, yeah, she wow. listened to it. She, she'd be like, she'd be like, all right, put on, you know, we get in the car, put on your music, we get in the house, put on your music. And then she would pick the one she liked. I'd find her listening to stuff. No way. You know, like I'm, the one that comes to mind right now is like Jimmy Eat World. And I don't mean Jimmy Eat World, like super popular Jimmy Eat World. Mm -hmm. I mean like, you know, uh, Static Prevails and Clarity before they had their like big moment. Okay. You know, and I was insane about this band and she just really loved them. She said she likes it more than Dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> so she's been to your shows, right? All, all the bands you've been in? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. awesome, man. Uh, you know what? That's a good question. I don't know that she's, I don't know that she ever saw my other bands. Yeah. But she saw Dashboard. You know, I think that, I think she stayed away for the purpose of like, man, this is not a place that you want to have to bring your mom. Yeah. But I'm here for you supporting you in every other way. Yeah. But like, you don't bring your mommy to go see your punk rock show, you yeah. know, or maybe you do, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think her attitude was like, no, this is yours, man. This is yours. When it became my career, she wanted to see what was happening uh, it, for herself. She's and, probably so stoked she, for you. Yeah. She couldn't believe, she couldn't believe it. She couldn't yeah. believe it. Yeah. What, what about, what, what, I think she, she was proud of herself too, by the way. And she should be. Should be. What about, what about your pops? Who's really not in the picture? Like, I think no, your parents got divorced. Yeah. Yeah. Not in the picture. Like, he was gone. He walked out when I was like three. Wow. And um, I think my Sorry. brother was my brother was like a week old. Uh, I know it's not. It's never been a thing that affected me. I had a gotcha. incredible stepdad. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when I my when I think I, they got married when I was a tween or early teen. Yeah. And um, and then he uh, they got they got a they got a divorce while I was still in high school, but it was a real cordial thing and everybody stayed in each other's lives. And, you know, okay. like my stepbrother from that, from that marriage is my, is my brother in all respects, you know, everything that counts. Awesome. And, you know, we never lost touch and I still am in touch with my stepdad and that's great. And, um, you know, like a, a nice positive, clean break. Yeah. You know? The yeah. way, if it's got to end, it's the way kind of the way it should end. Yeah. That's amazing. Do you have, um, Couple more things. Do you have do you have any regrets in your life? Man, I got so many regrets. I love when people say they have no regrets. Yeah, no it's regrets. happened a couple times to me. I'm like, really, no regrets. I mean, I've got too many to list. I would change so many, so many things. Yeah, I, I, I don't even know. Like you know, I could say that I don't know. There, I can generalize because it's hard for me to get down to specifics when asked because I'm washed over with the thousands of regrets I have. Mm. But I wish that I had like. I wish I had known how to communicate better when I was in Further Seems Forever or in bands when I was younger. I wish I understood how to walk through life without, um, under, with an understanding that like my point of view isn't right just because it's mine. Mm, you know, I, I love things, that too. That, that, that shit you don't learn until you're a little bit older. Yeah, you really could. Boy, it could have been really much more useful when I was younger. Yeah. Um, and I, I was, and uh, I, I mean, I, I kind of regret a lot of chances. I, I, I think I regret the chances I didn't take more than the outcomes of the chances that I did take that didn't work out. I got that too. That makes sense too. Yeah, it's crazy because yeah, I definitely had a few in my life for sure. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, we gotta. I think the regrets, like you said, or the regrets, any regrets we ever had, like we've. Um, move beyond that in, in a much better way than if I, I don't know I don't know how to say it, fucking knows but I know what you're saying though um, yeah. yeah do you consider yourself an optimist or pessimist I I don't consider myself one or the other because I I go through ranges of both go through yeah. ranges of both it's like situational mm -hmm. and uh and I wish I was, I wish I was one or the other. I feel like it'd be easier to get a handle on it. I think I'm a realist. That's what my wife is. I think people would, that's what my wife calls yeah. herself. Yeah. I think when, when you say a realist, people think that's pessimism, but I don't think it is. Nah. 
I think I just face the thing that really is the problem or is a problem and, and kind of like, yeah, this is real. I got to deal with it. Deal with it head on. And yeah. Yeah. But I think when I get the brunt of a situation that's like, all right, how are you going to view this thing? I guess initially I view it like a pessimist, like, okay. Oh, this is, I got to fix this mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking somehow this will be fixed on its own. But see, to me, that's a realist. Yeah. Yeah, you, you get along. My, yeah, I, my wife's very much like that too. She always calls herself that too. She deals yeah, with shit. Right. Yeah, it just speaks. Yeah. Um, do you have any daily rituals? Well, I've got rid, got rid of so many. I don't do my coffee ritual anymore. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I have I have daily rituals. I I um, I mean, I've been doing the same. Like, I I probably have warmed up my vocal vocals like every morning for without missing a day for the past decade or so. With the even same not day. on tour? Wow, it's amazing. Yeah, even not dude. on tour. Not that on tour, amazing. yeah. And um, Smart. I, I, I warm up on guitar doing the same, you know, I do the same long skits. It's about an hour to warm up my voice, an hour to warm up on guitar, even if I'm not going to use it that day. But what if I am? That's mm -hmm. kind of how I look at it. Every day you do and that. Then I, uh, wow. I do it every day. And then I, then I, um, I exercise every day. Uh, I've got a routine and a weekly routine that goes between running, cycling, weightlifting, Sick. stretching. <clears throat> and um, and then the other, I guess the, uh, you know, the, the rest of the routines are, are based around family. And so yep. that you have to be a lot less rigid about, right? Cause like you're not in charge, even though you're the fit, you, even though you're you know, figuratively in charge cause you're a parent, like you, you, you're just like, yeah, I've got my hand on the rudder, but I can't control the water. Mm-hmm. I love that, especially now too. And you're like locked down with your family. You're not leaving and coming back, and you do like all oh, that's super important, man. Balancing all that, man. Yeah. Have you ever ran the, ran the marathon before? Uh, yeah. Oh wow. The South Beach one. Awesome. So you love running. I love running and I love cycling. After the first. 20 minutes yeah. I hate it with mm, everything in my soul for the first 20 minutes <laughs> and then and then I love it from there on did you uh you do yoga too or no I do yoga sparingly I'm I'm I'm, I'm really like rigid and not as flexible in some areas of my body like my my left leg okay. my left leg's actually a little shorter than my right leg oh wow and so like that gives me a little trouble and then also these all these skateboard injuries that I have in my legs um, are, are lingering and I find if I commit to the yoga thing or the stretching thing I can continue uh, I can continue it like without t getting into a place where it's just like I'm doing it and not yeah. like suffering it Yeah. but once I if I even take like two days in a row off I have to go back to the suffering <laughs> so I've never been able to get to that mindful place that everybody goes to yeah so, cause it's like so much to me, it's, it's so much physical resistance. Um, but like anatomical resistance, but the, but, but I get there cycling and, 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 and running. That's I cool. get to that mindful place. Like, like where everything fucking goes away, except for maybe the one thing you need comes in and out. Like, Oh, this is the one thing that I'm, I'm worried. And it's cascading into all these tangents, but actually the crux of it is this one thing. Mm. And that, I, I noticed that I'll keep circling back to one thing as, yeah. a, as, you, as you try to clear your mind. And then I just think on it for a little while. And then it just kind of goes away. And boom, for a brief period there, I'm, I'm not thinking about anything. That's it's amazing. I like to do that, try to clear my head. It's hard sometimes. But yeah, I definitely exercise. All that stuff helps. Even going for walks. Have, when you've been running, have you wearing a mask? It, I tried. It's so hard, dude. I can't do it. It's hard. Can't I can't agree, so man. I, yeah, so so for a while I was just doing the treadmill, which is like, it's fine, but you know, it's also not. It, it also keeps you from getting to that place. Mm -hmm. um, you're getting healthy exercise, but you're not getting the, the other piece of your mind to unfold, open up. Maybe some people do, but I have yeah. trouble on the treadmill. Yeah, me too. So I find that if I go to like maybe a like a it's easier here to find like a rural or less dense area of town yeah. and, and not encounter anybody. And then I'll take the mask off there Yeah, and, uh, and run. It's like you're, 
I mean, you talk about the six feet rule, like maybe you're, maybe you're a hundred feet from a horse or something like that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Running with a mask is, is brutal, man. I don't know how people do it. They expect you to do it, but I tried so many times and just, I'm like dying, dude. I just can't breathe in it. It's hard, man. Yeah. It's, it's, but do you, um, do you have like new rituals now that just specific to the kind of world we've been living in the last three months? Yeah. I started doing push ups. So, <clears throat> I started doing 100 push-ups a day, and now I'm at 200 a day. And on my 50th birthday, I did 50 in a row, which I've never done in my entire life. I've never been... That's wild, man. Push-ups are so hard. Man. I know, man. But I love it. I love how I feel after. Um, I'm trying to exercise more. Like, we redid my garage into, like, a gym. We got a new pull-up bar and dips bar. I'm trying to do that. Yeah, I saw the picture of that. I was jealous. Thank you, man. <laughs> uh, that was really fun to do. I guess coffee. I guess I'm, I guess I'm on coffee life now. That's something. Um yeah, I'm going to try to take walks by myself, trying to like, I don't know, man. Maybe I've been writing more stuff. I'm trying to like write a book, like an auto, I guess an autobiography, I guess. I'm just trying to just write stories and stuff about my life and maybe put it together and maybe do something with it. I don't know yet. I I'm doing know. that too. Oh, you are? Oh, that's awesome. Just write yeah, a journal? I'm yeah, I'm, I'm writing it out in free form and figure I'll have to just go, be, go through and find the chronology of it all and see yeah. what doesn't fit, what does fit. And and I that's cool. I think there's even odds that this thing never sees the light of day in terms of ever getting off my computer. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm really enjoying the process of, of getting it's therapeutic, it right? I'm not even. Yeah, it is therapeutic. So like for me, it's just like this therapeutic, satisfying in, in endeavor. Okay. Whether anybody ever reads it or not is of less consequence to me. I like that. I, I definitely feel like I talk about this all the time, and I got to do it one day. But I definitely feel that. Music has been so therapeutic, just writing songs. I definitely think that me and my mom and my three brothers need therapy after my dad died when I was younger. It's definitely fucked us all up the rest of our lives. And I feel like if I just write shit about my life, I feel so much better, man. Just like, even if besides just music and lyrics, just writing stuff on pieces of paper, it's it just, I don't know, man. It just feels so good. Like you said, if nobody ever gets to see it or I even read it after I write it, just to have it written somewhere, it's just, it's just getting it out, you know? It's funny you should say that, you know, part of the impetus for me to start writing this this book was I started before the pandemic, um, but to come back to it now and be like, oh, let's see what else is, is living in my head. Mm. Um, but my my therapist uh, stopped, didn't stop taking appointments uh, personally okay. um, right away. And so I didn't feel real comfortable going there. Having just been in New York, I was in New York the night they closed it down and I was like, oh, oh, OK, wow. yeah. This is this is really really real, yes. and it never hit Tennessee or has yet to hit Tennessee the way it hit there. Okay. So people here, because you only know what you know, right? You yep. only know what you're exposed to. So they see the things on the news, but that's not happening here. So they're a little bit more lax. Totally understand. Yeah. Um, but I'm operating under the conditions that I've seen, so I'm not I'm not willing to go and sit in his office that I a place I savor and that helps me so much. And what's the trade-off? Going, you know, like not not getting better or maybe getting worse. So instead, I started digging into the the, the book, and at least it has a place for that to go. You know, I love that. Do, do you think I was saying this yesterday? Like, we're healthy. We got families. We have our careers. We have music. Like, we're not like we're not str struggling. Like, we're 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 okay right now. Um, but there and 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 we're. I don't know how to say it, but it's like, and I don't know really what depression, what depression, I know what it is because I've been there before, but <clears throat> do you feel like it's, it's mentally just on us personally because we are musicians and because like, obviously my wife's working from home. My son's going to, uh, taking zoom school. They're doing their shit, but I'm kind of lingering, not knowing. And I feel like as much as I, like I said, I feel healthy and I'm happy and I'm lucky to be where I'm at that it's, it's a, it's a mental f fuck a little bit. Like just, it's it's weighing on you, right? Like, <clears throat> even though, like, if you're good right now, or who long, you, who knows how long you're gonna be good for, as far as financially, both of us, whatever. Regardless, like, the, just the not knowing, I feel like it's definitely like, it's weighing on me, and I'm not really showing it to my family. I'm just kind of like, they know that like all my shit's been canceled, but I'm really just like, holy shit, like, what? When's it gonna happen? Like, do you think that's weighing on you? A lot. It's weighing on I me mean, intensely, man, intensely. And I, I don't want to. I don't want to walk through life with the uh, black cloud. I don't want to be the yes. the the guy that says, "I when I don't want to have a an, 
the real answer when people are like, how you doing B man, the world, the sky's falling, but yeah. the sky's kind of fallen for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but there is literally nothing I can do. So instead of being, instead of, uh, letting that like strain and worry spill over into every other aspect of my life and my social relationship and my yes. social life, my relationships with friends, yep. uh, I, I'm funneling it into this kind of healthy uh, ex exercise of, of writing this book. And now the yeah. big question I keep being asked is like, oh, so, oh, you must be writing and they mean music. You must be writing your ass off. And I'm not at all because I write what, when I, when I, my chance to write comes when, well, first of all, I, I did just write a record and I yes. usually take time off because I don't want to just write the same record by accident. Exactly. You want to get, yeah, re inspired, all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. But, but also, like, man, it's hard for me to write a record unless it's like, oh, I can reflect on things that have happened. When things are happening that need to be dealt with, it's really hard to get into a place of like, well, let me, let me write about this thing that's happening now. How can I write about it if I haven't processed it? Yeah, I agree, man. I, I'm still Everybody wants to do a side project, and I want to do them too. I'm so excited about all these like little band projects I might have that have been presented to me, but I also have got to be like true to like the artist inside me and not just like the guy that knows I can craft something, you know, because I have enough practice. Yeah. I, I feel like, I feel like I'm just kind of like frozen right now. I'm not really, I'm, I'm living and, and like I'm saying, we're going to go hiking today. They're going to get out and get into real life and mask up and all that stuff. I'm living, but I also feel like until I know, like, I have something confirmed and I'm going to be playing a show and it's definitely happened and I can look forward to it. It's hard when you have nothing not to look forward to because just living, we, we look forward to living every day with all that. But speaking from a musician, which you understand is like not having something on your calendar, having all your shit canceled, move back. Like you said, the records postponed, all these tours, everything. You didn't tour all last year because you're going to do focus on the 20 years this year. And now that's gone. It's just hard to get mo not, not motivated. It's just hard to maybe get inspired. I, I don't know. It's just, it, well, there's, there's like, there's a level of fear that permeates yes. what's going on. And there's Skeptical. a le level of like, um, doubt, like, could they really ever bring this back? Of course they will. But you know what? The truth is, it'll be like, it'll be, as we sit here now, we know it'll be later than we want it. Yes. And when it comes back and they tell us it's coming back, the first thing we're going to think is like, is that too soon? Mm. So it's a it's gonna be a tricky thing to navigate. Yeah, and will people come? But, will they be scared? Is it like anybody gonna show up? Yeah, I don't know, man. But I guess I guess we have uh, we know that you. I know that you are going to go to shows. I know that I'm gonna go to shows. Yes, and so I just kind of trust that other people are gonna do that too. Will there be less people? Of course at first and will there have to be yes and and when there doesn't have to be there probably will still be less but but there'll be but people and will need this as much as they did before maybe even they'll, they might even need it more i would than they say did i would say i would say way more and i, I like what milo said milo well, milo was like i'm kind of nervous about putting you know descendants fans in a situation where they could get sick like he he's nervous about moving forward and being responsible for that to happen to them on and who wants to play with like a 20 foot barricade you know what i mean have no connection to the fans just to play because you want to fulfill something you want to play and the, and the fans are way over there i don't know it's just there's so much to think about yeah we have a we have a positional responsibility in that yeah and like for from it for me and for you i'm sure for you too like we're like germ collectors, at least. I hand the microphone out, I collect people's spit, they give it back to me, I sing on the same mic, we're sweating on each other, there's so much shit being passed, and at the same time, I've talked to a lot of my musician friends, they're like, hey, we've traveled so much, slept on floors, played shitty girls' venues, all this stuff, he goes, maybe musicians have, I know, I know musicians have been affected by it, but maybe our immune systems are just a tad bit stronger because we have been through all these gross venues and all the traveling we've done in airplanes. Man, and I hadn't thought about that. I had never thought about that. But just, that <laughs> that has to be true on some level. You know what I mean? Whoa. Yeah. Like, am I going to make like a, a microphone condom for the shows and cover my mic so nobody spit? I, like, I don't know. Do I want to play at a drive-in and sit in a car and watch my favorite band in the car? I don't know if I want to no do way. that. I don't want to do no that. I don't want to do that, man. 
So we got to wait. That's it. We got to wait. <sighs> okay, last two questions for you. We've been almost three hours. I'm fucking so psyched. I'm so jacked in coffee. Um, what would be your top favorite skaters or skate trick? Oh, man. Um, my top favorite skaters. I know you said Matt um, Hensley. Matt Hensley's one of them. There you go. Matt Hensley's one of them. Dylan Reeder was one of them. He's gone. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, rest Chris in peace. Cole. Probably That's my, my dude. Top. He's the yeah, best, dude. He loves your band, ever. too. Is that your friend, too? Yeah. That's the yeah, homie. Yeah, he is now. I love like, Chris, That's dude. after years of me. Just, I mean, I only found that out after I'd already been totally devoted to him forever. Dude, he loves uh, your band. He loves all... Dude, he's an amazing human, dude. He, he's a sick dude. He's the greatest guy. Right, Chris um, Cole's in there. Chris Cole. Sean Malta. Um, I would say... Yeah, I said Hensley, right, of course. Mike Valley. Ooh. He's ill, too. What about um, any, any 80s cats, like from the Bones Brigade, stuff like that, or no? Yeah, man. Um, Caballero. Yeah, the best. I mean, yeah. I even, like, I even like buy all of his motorcycle gear for my motorcycle Oh, stuff. that's cool. Yeah. He's I've amazing. Got, I mean, literally every everything he puts out for dirt bike stuff, I buy. That's cool. Because he's like, I love that he crosses those two worlds, and I do, too. Have you met him before? Oh, briefly, man, at a war at a lot. Wait, warp tour. Like standing on stage to watch watch Blink on the side stage, nice. and he was there. And I went up so sheepishly to say hello. And he's such a <laughs> warm, nice he's guy. So sweet, man. And uh, and um, and he was just yeah. That, that was my brief one. And then I would say, tied up there for the last spot are uh, Day One Song and and Rodney Mullen. Ooh. And that's not a spot. That's not a ranking of in order. Of yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because those guys, in terms of skill, are probably the top. Dude, Roddy um, Mullen, Per Willander, the freestyle shit. I was a freestyle kid too. Like, incredible man, dude. I mean, and when he turned to street skating, when he when he got a full deck and just yeah, showed everybody like any doubters that were like, well, yeah, you can do that on that little skating board, but what about a real skateboard? That's not a real skateboard. And he was just <laughs> like, oh sure, let me just let me just show you what skateboarding is going to be. Did you 10 see, years from now, you saw, you'll catch up. He's a super genius. Do you saw the Bones Brigade documentary? Dude, I saw that. And listen to this. I saw, oh I saw, I went to a premiere of it in um, Florida and, um, and I was watching it and I looked to my right and Ollie Gelfin's there. He's the guy who invented the Ollie. Oh yeah. 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 And you know, he's on Bones Brigade. And I was like, what? Dude, you're, oh my God. I lost it. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. Um, what was one of your favorite tricks? Um, my favorite trick is probably Ollie Impossible. Nice. Um, uh, let's see. My favorite trick is, uh, Ollie Impossible, um, maybe Crooked Grind. Nice. And maybe a Smith, oh no, a Disaster Slide. I, I love, I, I love, really this, I love those. I love. I'm not sure they call it. I'm not sure they call it that anymore. Well, not they used sure. to. I, I know what but, you're saying. And the Smith Grind's so sick. Yeah. What can you still do? You think all of it? Uh, well, I don't think I can do that shit on a handrail anymore. But oh, that I was a handrail. Do, uh, Damn, that's awesome. Yeah, so I can do, but I can do like a Smith grind. I can't really do a crook. I can do a Smith grind. I can do disaster. I can do uh, all impossible. I can do, I got a lot of my tricks. They're just like maybe may, maybe like curb crew now. Okay, as opposed to Slappies. real stuff. Yeah, did you ever do yeah. hand plants or airs and stuff like that or on skate vert? I never did hand plants or airs because I was like strictly street and then that, that okay. era of street after street plants yeah. is when I came up. Um, but I don't – and airs, I mean like on a mini ramp I can do like ollie stuff, but like like proper airs like on a vert ramp, vert ramp or on a – even a vert – even even like a vert spot. You know, I never – you know what? Another trick that I love is like totally underrated, but I love wall rides and wallies. Those are cool. I just love that feeling of like Mark Gonzalez, wait a minute, Tom this, Giro. This def, this, yeah, this defies physics for a minute. You know, yeah. I love that feeling. I I, 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 I want I want to go on record and say my goal is to skate with you one day, like skate a mini ramp or something. It'd be so awesome, man. Oh, let's do that. I wish let's I had a mini ramp, dude. I wish, man. My son. Well, was, when you go ahead. come here, I I know a friend in the next neighborhood over that's got got a mini ramp. I'm not great at ramp stuff, like I said, like. Uh, I'm just a street skater, like yeah. actual street. So, uh, but I'll, I'll I'll go and I'll 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 shake the dust up before you get here, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll take you over there. What what would be? Do you have a, what would be any uh, last one? Top five? Do you have a top five? It could be hip hop, punk, any like ins inspirational musicians or artists. 
Man. Punk, um, punk hip hop, whatever. Okay, so I gotta say, like for me, top five. Oof, it's not enough. I mean, it's never enough when it's just five. But I'll say, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm still go with like hold true to like those teen year, tween years of Run DMC. Sick. Um, that, I remember that just blew my mind open. Um, and Wu Tang Clan. Yes. Um, I'll go Respect. with Fugazi. Woo. Uh, the Cure and Built to Spill. Damn. I got I got all four of those. I, I never heard Built to Spill. I got to check them out. Oh man, I think you'd love them. Damn, Cure Fugazi. Listen Run to DMC. that. Wow. Wu-Tang. Listen to the album by Built to Spill called Keep It Like a Secret. Keep It Like a Secret? Yeah, it's transcendent. It's just incredible. Have you checked out the Wu series on Netflix? Oh, man. It's on deck, man. Dude. I'm, I'm, ex- I'm excited. It's so I, good. Yo, I like I have a... Str- How is it that you like ended up palling around with Madonna and I ended up becoming pals with Method, man? You did? What? Like what? Like what world what do we live in? Fuck? Coming up the way we did, that that was a thing. Like you would have told me the least expected thing that I would have, that it would ever have in my life is that I could text Method Man right, right now. Uh, how that happen? Through dashboard or just? It just through yeah, kind of. Except for this, all right. So check it out. I Holy go shit. to I get invited to see this kid I came up with down in South Florida became a. A, a really incredible director and showrunner. Okay. And the shows, the, the, the two two of the shows he had were first he did the da- Daredevil series on Netflix. Yep, I saw that. I watched and that. And then, yeah, incredible. And then when they all came together as Defenders, like the the Jessica Jones and Luke Cage, okay, Iron Fist and Daredevil came. And he he produ- he directed that and produced that series. Okay. So when that premiered, he invited me to the premiere to go see that. And Method Man was um, on the Daredevil. Wasn't Method Man on Daredevil? He was on Luke Cage. Okay, Luke Cage. That's right. Okay. Right. So, so we sit, we sit down, and I look to my left, and he, Marco had Marco Ramirez, my friend. He had sat me next to Method Man, wow. which was like sick. You know, I know he knew what he was doing. Yeah. And look, man, I don't get too starstruck too easily. Yeah. I'm not totally disaffected, but I couldn't say anything. I'm like trying, I'm I'm trying to get there. I'm like, I can't let this moment go by. So I'm like, Hey, Method Man, my name is Chris. We, we, we played, we've played at some shows together. And he goes, (laughs) I know. He goes, I know. What? No way, dude. Yeah. And I go, yeah. And he goes, and he named off the three places we played together. It was like two colleges and then one festival. And I was like, but I'm like, oh, look, man, I know how I know that because it's ingrained in my memory. It's like the, you know, high points of my yeah. career. Why do, why do you remember that? And he just looks at me and he goes, Method Man. Wow, dude, that's fucking he, you know, amazing, and, dude. Yeah. So then I you know I got he remembered to, you. I got to pal around with his 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 nephew. He's a sick. Uh, his 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 name is Dantel. Okay. And he's. He's sick, dude. He's sick, and he's you, God's son. You, God's son. Man, okay. you should look out. For, yeah, you got to look out for this kid. He's he's sick. Anyway, uh, so the three of us ended up, and my wife, we ended up hanging out for a while, and we stayed friends. And I got this text from his nephew when I was in where was I? New Zealand, man. I was in New Zealand of all places, right? You're in New Zealand. Meth wants you to come to the show. He's playing tonight at the you know arena. Wow. So I said. Uh, uh, all right. I'm like, I'll, I'll see if I can go, man. I'm a little jet lagged. And he wrote back. He goes, yo, when meth invites you to show you, go. I he wrote back to you? Oh, shit. You're right. You're right. When meth invites you to a show, you go. Was it a solo? Solo? Was it him and Redman? Or? Yeah, it was him and Redman. That's sick. It was like billed as Wu-Tang, but it wasn't all the Wu-Tang yeah. guys. You know how that goes. What year was that? That was last year. Oh, no, last year? year? And so you got, you got ago, Method Man ago. on text. That's sick. Yeah. Wow, man. That's a good name drop. If you're gonna name drop during a during an interview, dude, that's the one to go with. And it's so it's so random. Like I was like, holy shit, man, that's sick, man. Yep. Awesome. So wow. that was a that was a satisfying thing for like the adults in me on every level that that rings back to the kid in me, you know. Yeah. And I hate when people are like, dude, my my 
my 16 year old self is freaking out right now. It's like, Rab, well, what about yourself right now? <laughs> you know, know 45 like, year old self. Yeah. Yeah. Like this guy here, I'm freaking out. Like also I'm, you know, I'm getting a kick out of it as my old, my young self, but this guy's getting a kick out of it. And how was the show? They probably killed it, huh? Oh, he killed it. He crushes it. Dude, they, 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 <sighs> so good. His, so good solo records were incredible. To Cal, to Cal, all those records were just so good, man. He's super underrated, man, as an MC too. Super underrated, oh, yeah. man. Oh yeah, totally underrated. And he's he's an underrated actor too. He's an incredible actor, I think. You know, his comedy stuff is kind of like the roles he's played is kind of goofy sometimes, and that's been the shtick, and that's fine. But like his, he's a good actor. His, yeah, he, his dramatic stuff is good. Yeah, he was on the HBO show about New York City with uh, I forgot, I forgot what it's called. It's about all the prostitution of Forty Second Street. Yeah, uh, um, I forgot what it's called. The Deuces, Deuces. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Do you, are you guys, are you guys binge watch any Netflix stuff right now? Do you, do you guys watch Ozark or anything? Oh yeah, incredible man. Yep, incredible. Um, I'm, uh, there's not a show I don't think that exists that I haven't watched at this point of this thing. Yeah, we rewatched Sopranos. We watched Breaking Bad. We watched Better Call Saul now. Um, I've rewatched all those. I rewatched The Wire. <laughs> Wire's so uh, good. I, I rewatched. Uh, um, the, I've rewatched Fargo Ooh. and True Detective. Great. Well, first season is first season's the best. Did you yeah. guys watch? You guys watch Dead to Me? No, not yet. That's uh, I missed Apple it because it's like my my wife my wife lapped me on it, so I got to catch up. That's a good one. Sex Education's a good one. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, there's so many fucking dude. Netflix and the online, all that streaming stuff is probably killing it right now, man. I can't imagine, man. Yeah. It's insane. I, mean, I want to go to the movie theater now. Providing a social service right now, dude. I heard that maybe was it was it Netflix or Hulu? No, no. I heard Prime Prime Video, Amazon is going to possibly buy AMC theaters. Really? So like that's a big another like terror. Wow. Like what are the things that are going to change our world in the days to come? You know, like yeah. like, like things even as simple as where we get our entertainment from when we go out. It's going to change. What about going to the movies, man? I love that. We're going to sit six feet apart from everybody in the movies. Like, how's that going to work, man? I don't know. I saw some, some footage of that in some somewhere in Germany, I think. Wow. And, you know, they're there. They're there. And the rest of the seats are covered. I mean, they're bringing back sports. I'm happy about that. You know, the basketball, I heard that. hopefully they're bringing back basketball. And I see hockey's coming back. And it's doable. No fans. But, um, but I... I, I will I would miss that if I was a player and I certainly miss that as a fan. Yeah, imagine just playing a show to nobody and just trying to like get, I don't know, it's yeah, I can't I've been doing it in my living room, man. In my <laughs> studio here. <laughs> you played you just Oh, that's right, you've been doing that. Things. That's right. What do you think about that? I was gonna ask this okay, those final thing. The live streams you're doing is sick and so is it do you love it? Is it weird? Is it is all of the above. Yeah, I love it totally. because I, I understand like this is as close as I'm gonna get. Totally. Is it the same? Not even at all. Yeah. Um but I do love it. I like uh, it, it'd be a little bit better if I could see the comments because the computer's so far away with filming yeah. and everything like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I love, but I love, I, I love that there's interaction going on. Yes. And that we have, like, you know, our, our, our real live stream that we've actually promoted that we did a fundraiser with. Yep. I saw we that. We had 6,000 people. It's amazing. So that's like right? a, sh that's like a huge ass show. A massive show. Um, but you know, there's only but the only person in attendance is me. Yeah. So, so it's 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 bizarre, and you're like you got to just dig 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 down deep and find a way to like summon something more out of the song than just you going through the motions. And you can do it. You can do it. Do you feel? And so you I get nerve. You get nervous. I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, man. Fuck yeah, Toby. It's like wait, what? This this isn't what we do. So yeah. of course I get nervous. Yeah, I get way nervous. Probably way more nervous, and I already get nervous before. Because you're sitting in your nervous. house in the comfort of your home by yourself, chilling, and you still get nervous. So you, that, yeah, yeah. You start playing, and you're like, "This is fine," but then you finish playing, and you're like, it's "Oh wait, do I do I talk?" <laughs> there was, certainly, there's no cheering, <laughs> yeah. but do I do, it's, do I talk? Do I go right into the next song? <laughs> and then you realize you've been standing in front of the camera just thinking for 45 seconds wow. okay i guess i better go into the next song and then you blurt out oh i guess i'm gonna go into the next song wow so, you know you're, it's not like i've got this thing wired yet but one thing that i think will come of it is i think these is more maybe not as many live streams i'm certainly going to play songs here and there continuing when the live stuff comes back when the live show world comes back 
I'll still live stream songs every now and again because I think I've found a way to really enjoy that connection. With yeah. People. But I think the conversations, like if you and I were to have a conversation and li- co live stream together, yeah. Um, you know, just for a half hour one day, I think that would, that would, you know, not everybody can make it to your show. Yeah. So, so somewhere, somebody somewhere that wanted to be there feels like they were there for part of your day. I think that is something that I'll keep doing. No, I love that. I love that, man. That's amazing. Especially now people need that. Just seeing you and hearing the songs and uh, I know we should do to know what I would do with you. Once I figure out when they're going to drop this, this part looks, this might be a two parter. We should do like an Instagram live or something. The day it drops. Hey, I'll be on, I'll be on Instagram live with Chris and come on. We'll talk on there. And then, Hey, we dropped the episode. That'd be kind of fun. I think. Yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. That'd be awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time. I feel like I talked to you forever. It's been three hours. It's amazing. We covered everything. If I think of any more things, I'll call you back. But I'm super psyched. I'm psyched to finally catch up with you. I'm, I'm, I want to thank you for all the music you put out in the world, everything you've done. It's inspiring. I learned a lot about you today. Um, I love hearing the stories and reminiscing and just hearing your journey. And um, this was long overdue. You know, I'm glad, I got, I'm glad we're back in contact as well. Like, It's awesome. Buddy, thank you so much. And, you know, thanks for for giving me the chances you've given me all, all over these years and and uh, and also just being an inspiration to me, so many of us. Thank you, brother. And um, I'll be in touch, and I really appreciate your time today. And uh, we're going to get through this, and we'll be playing shows in no time, you know, I hope. I'm in. Let's do it. Let's get to it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for dedicating these three hours. I really appreciate it, Chris. My pleasure. Thanks, Toby. All right, brother. Bye. Bye. Check, check, check. Check. Hello. I'm all good, and you sound great. Are you there? Uh, check, check. I'm here. I'm all here. right, so Chris, this is only, first of all, I'm excited about this. Uh, so it's going to be a two-parter because we did over three hours. So we have a part one and a part two. That rules. Um, okay, so this is the only question I didn't ask you, and Adam Blake was bummed. Adam Blake has always prided himself on having the best hair in hardcore. Him and Todd <laughs> Friend have had the yeah. slick, the slick backs, the spikes, and and, oh, yeah. and 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 out of some hair envy, he wanted me to ask you if there was a, any kind of secret product you use. He really wanted me to ask you that yesterday. Like, how is your hair always so good? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't really. I don't use anything consistently. But back in the um, day, you had like that. That's in the front. It was just perfect. Yeah, but uh, my <laughs> like, I think that the trick is is like for some reason my hair grows straight up. So yeah, you got a great I, hairline, yes. I, so all I can do is just go with it. I, I, my hair is long now. I I'm know. Still doing the thing in the front where it like just grows straight up. Um, so you, I guess you, I, you're trying to say it was, I, it was bedhead, just bedhead, this regular hair? And... No, no, I put stuff in it, but I'm just saying uh, I don't have a magical mask. I use whatever was around, like Murray's. Murray's! Or, uh, I mean, Murray's is probably what I used the most. Okay, that was the but, 90s shit. You know, that's some stuff you get me, drugstore, whatever, you know? Yeah. It's perfect. You don't You don't need a... But you know, remember how that stuff would just not wash out at yeah, all? Yeah, we used it. I mean, Adam Blake's going to be super stoked because him and Todd Friend, all they used in the 90s was Murray's for sure. Yeah, I'm sure that's who I heard about it from. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be even flattered on that. Yeah, that was my only question. Adam's like, you ask him about his hair? Because Adam's all about hair and like he prided himself. Hey, we, have, we have the best. We're handsome hardcore. We have the best hair in the hardcore scene. I'm like, all right, so we're down. Um, okay, so, Mar- so we're going to go with Murray's then. Yeah. Okay, amazing. All right, Chris, thank you for getting back on the phone. Like I said, part one and part two. Um, I'm super stoked and I appreciate your time always. All right, Toby. Be All good, right, brother. Bud. Okay, bye. Bye. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. Um, please rate, review, uh, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed yet to this podcast, please do that. And whatever platform you are listening to this on, I'm glad you found me. You can rate me and review me on there also. So thank you guys sincerely for the support. I cannot wait for you guys to hear the next one.